Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, Productivity and Human Resources is under the microscope as we talk to Presidential Advisor Sunil Vijay Singha. Then, Nielsen's Managing Director Shaheen Carter analyzes the latest PCI data. And finally, columnist Samantha Amarasinghe discusses Sri Lanka's fiscal outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. The topic under discussion today is human resources and productivity in Sri Lanka. In particular, we focus on the huge workforce in the state sector as well as providing employment to the annual entrance into Sri Lanka's workforce. To give his perspective with us today is Sunil Vijay Singha, advisor to the President on Productivity Promotion and he is also the President of the National Chamber of Commerce Sri Lanka. Well, it's so good to have you on the show on Benchmark, Mr. Vijay Singha. Could you just give me a brief overview of the state of human resources here in Sri Lanka? I think it's uh, woefully inadequate uh, for what we are trying to achieve because uh, uh, we are not producing enough uh, people with the science and technology background. Uh, we really need people with that sort of background. And uh, if you take uh, some people give examples of even South Korea having uh, less scientists than what we had at Independence. And, now they have far more than what we have. So we have uh, gone on the wrong track. And uh, we really need to promote more science and technology. And even if uh, we have uh, people coming out of universities without science and technology, there should be some initiative to uh, reorient them into science and technology streams because that is what is required uh, for today's business. Now, undoubtedly, the economy and the labor markets will have to meet those new challenges of providing productive employment opportunities to the unemployed as well as those annual entrants into the labor market that we will continue to see each year. Now, while at the same time increasing the levels of productivity and incomes for the large numbers of working poor, how are we going to do this? I think uh, once again, uh, productivity is a misunderstood term. Productivity does not mean paying uh, the least to your workers and uh, being competitive. Productivity, the real modern definition of productivity means that while you are competitive and you are make, having good returns on your investment, you are also able to pay well to your employees so that they have a better standard of living. Now to do that, we can't do it with our existing uh, low-level uh, uh, industries. The educational level of our people have increased and uh, we, we are no longer competitive with very low-level type of industries that has already gone to countries with uh, very cheap labor, less educated labor. So we need to really upgrade our industries. We need to add value and go on that uh, value addition stream and uh, also at the same time the government has a role to play to educate people uh, to, uh, to, to produce people fit enough for, for those jobs uh, which are at a higher level because productivity if you measure productivity it is the GDP of the country divided by the employed workforce. So some people see our low ratio and say our people are not working hard. Actually our people may be working even harder than countries uh, where their productivity is much higher. But it is because with all that effort they are producing a very low value. So we have to increase the value. Now a TA state worker uh, may be working very hard under difficult circumstances in the upcountry, in the mist and rain and all that. But producers say maybe 15 kilos of tea. But uh, uh, a worker in a high-tech industry in Singapore, or Japan or South Korea uh, will work less, with less fatigue, much better working conditions and produce a thousand times more. 
in terms of value. So that is what we really need to do and that is why we have such a huge battle on the collective agreement with plantations because that is the biggest component of cost and we cannot afford to pay even that last increase. You know, some com companies are complaining that that is going to be a big hit on their bottom line, but uh, that is the reality. So, we need to work on that. The state sector is also known to be burdened with an abnormally large workforce. Now, if I am right, in the year 2012, public sector employment rose at a rate of something like 4.3 percent to 1.23 million. How are we going to address this issue? Yes. I think the government feels that they have a role to play in providing uh, employment. And uh, traditionally, people have preferred to work in the public sector uh, rather than in the private sector because of a certainty of uh, tenure and things like that. And also, you have to work harder. In fact, in the words of a former Minister of Labor, when he asked uh, a person why he uh, left the private sector and joined the public sector, he says in the private sector you have to work sir. So, uh, so things like that. Uh, but the most disturbing trend is that uh, for example, when I first got involved with Dankotur in 1990, a factory worker in our factory was getting more, significantly more than the lowest level unskilled employee in, in a public sector or even a corporation. Today is the other way around because even the salaries have increased so that uh, with much less uh, effort you get much more. So there is, a, there is a great interest in finding a public sector job because for two reasons, one is you are paid better and the other reason is you work less and you are uh, assured of uh, job security. So, this is uh, something that uh, is a huge uh, problem. Uh, I do not mind the public sector increasing if there is some value being created in the public sector, but uh, productivity has never been uh, uh, an important consideration in uh, public sector jobs. So, this is something that uh, really needs a uh, complete overhaul. We take a short commercial break now and when we come back, we discuss with Sunil Vijaysingha, Sri Lanka's export performance, the importance of regional trade agreements and Sri Lanka's improved performance in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Welcome back to Benchmark. We continue our discussion with the President of the National Chamber of Commerce of Sri Lanka, Sunil Vijay Singh. Now, in your capacity as President of the National Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Vijay Singh, uh, we have been seeing our export performance, the country's export performance actually declining. Uh, it was 33% of our GDP in 2000, it is now 16% in 2012. How do you actually rate the country's export performance in this light and our future prospects? Now, this is something that we have been talking about, bringing to the notice of the authorities. But unfortunately, we were told at that time, we have been fighting about this for the past 10 years or more, but unfortunately we were told that we are not worried about a handful of exporters. 
that was the government's view at that time. And I continued to say that you will realize the importance of the export, export industry when exports start coming down. They said, no, we are an import dependent country, uh, dependent country and exports uh, are not so important. Then I kept, we kept on saying about the depreciation because, the depreci because our rupee was overvalued uh, and uh, we had uh, a big uh, revaluation of the rupee after the tsunami, all those was causing problems. And uh, they didn't listen. In fact, I was told, don't even talk about depreciation. That's, that's something I shouldn't talk about. And then suddenly they depreciated the rupee, which means that we were right. And in fact, things are so bad, the exporters were uh, so badly treated, whereas uh, uh, we had a decade of exports uh, under the previous government. And the slogan was, export or perish. And suddenly everything changes and they say, no, exporters are not important. In fact, at a strategy seminar organized by the EDB, one exporter said, I think you should change the slogan, export and perish. So this is, uh, these reversals of policies uh, and inconsistencies create a lot of problems for exporters. Do you see us in reality perishing? No, I don't think we will perish. We will still continue uh, because sometimes uh, difficult times uh, are also useful because that's the time when you re-strategize and you re take all these realities into account and you come up with something better which will be uh, better in the long run because even during the, the recession when, when competitiveness was, uh, was very tough. That's the time that companies went in for lean management and all these strategies because otherwise it's like an iceberg. You don't see all your inefficiencies because it's all underwater, nine tenths underwater, you don't see it. But in tough times, uh, you really need to uh, look at all those things and improve your efficiency to your utmost. Do you think that we as a nation have made the best or optimized on the opportunities available to strengthen ties at least within the region? I don't think so. I, I don't think we have done that. And that's something that we really need to focus on. Sri Lanka advanced in the latest uh, World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, moving up 15 places uh, from last year. What measures do you think, or what further measures do you think we need to put into place to actually become a hub for business? First and foremost, I don't place much value in that index. I think, uh, I think uh, overall it is good to have a good ranking in that. But when you speak to many investors, I mean, they don't purely go on that. They really come and study the ground situation here and they take that decision. But I must say that for them to even look at Sri Lanka, maybe they would have looked at that. But it is a good thing for us to keep on doing things to have uh, the strategies I think already I believe Central Bank has some uh, some initiative to improve this now that is very good because then you really try and improve uh, the indicators the sub indicators you uh, try and remove the bottlenecks uh, which give you a lower rating so that exercise is good but uh, the index alone is not what matters now if you if you ask a lot of the investors who have really come here, uh, they, many of them have told me they don't really study this index, but they have some good contacts here who, who give them a lot more information than what is given in the index. And uh, I think that reality is uh, much more important. Mr. Vijay Singh, do you really feel that enough is being done by our corporates to achieve business excellence? And if not, what are the key ingredients that need to be put in place? Uh, I don't think they are doing enough uh, and the saddest part is that uh, some corporates believe that uh, for them to really advance and to make profits, to grow, uh, what they need is not business excellence but some influence with the government. In fact, when we have been trying to promote because you know even the National Chamber has a business excellence award. And when we try to promote business excellence, some people have told me that's not what matters. 
quite a few people uh, contribute to that view that uh, it depends on how you can lobby and you know get your uh, deal through or your business uh, and the policies uh, in, in your favor and things like that. Which factors do you think are, is actually limiting the quality of our workforce in Sri Lanka? I think uh, a lot is connected to the culture and training and uh, uh, now we always talk about the Japanese culture. I mean Japanese culture enables uh, quality because for them uh, bad quality is uh, uh, not a thing uh, that they will tolerate. Uh, in fact customer service is the most important thing. That's, that's why even some Japanese uh, lecturers say that the Japan, Japanese have three levels of bowing. The, the smallest angle is for your peers, then for your parents, teachers and so on. And the lowest level of buying, which is the highest uh, honor, is to the emperor and to your customers. So that's how they treat customers. And I have been to Japan over 30 times or so, and I see this. For them, the customer is so important. Uh, because their whole culture says, don't focus on yourself. The other man is much more important. So you go to even a meeting in Japan and you sit at a table or something like that, you're not supposed to pour your own water for you. The other person has to pour the water and you, know, and you have to pour the water for him. So other person, always treat the other person, do something for the other person. Don't make the other person have any inconvenience. So that's a cultural trait, uh, which uh, unfortunately in our case, we consider that we are the most important, I'm the most important. So that's why it's difficult to create that service culture. Thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Vijay Singha. That was Sunil Vijay Singha, the president of the National Chamber of Commerce of Sri Lanka on Benchmark. On the other side, we have Shaheen Khader, MD of Nielsen, who's going to discuss the Business Confidence Index and also economist and LMD columnist, Samantha Amara Singha on the economy. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja and with me now is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader, with the latest in business confidence. Now, uh, Shaheen, what are the main causes for the downward spiral in biz confidence? Yeah, actually, uh, Anushan, the Business Confidence Index has actually declined to 131 in May, uh, down from, uh, I think, 158 uh, in January. So it's, uh, and it's the lowest, uh, at the lowest level, unfortunately, since September of last year. So there are, I think, two or three contributory factors to this. Number one is there is increasing uh, pessimism about the economy. And I think uh, there's also increasing pessimism about business outlook in the next three months. And I think thirdly, this comes, I think, on the back of uh, electricity hikes. Uh, there's an unprecedented increase uh, in the percentage mentioning corruption as a, as a major concern. So it was only 10% in April, and now 69% in May have said the corruption is a concern. So I feel these have contributed to, to the decline. How do respondents view our economy's future growth trajectory? I think, uh, as I said, there is concern about economic growth. 
Um, I think some of the reasons, obviously, corruption is one of the one of the reasons that we are, uh, people are concerned, business sector, as well as um, uh, I think concerns about inflation remain high. About over three fourths, about seventy six percent, in fact, mentioned that they are concerned about uh, the inflation situation in this country, and therefore, you know. There is a future growth. Uh, there is a concern that um, growth may not be as expected. What about our investment climate, Shahin? What are the main issues faced by business people when it comes to investment? I think in concerns about um, the investment climate have increased since January. So in January, about 17% said the investment climate was poor. But in May, that actually almost doubled to 29%. I, we feel that you know the high interest rates that are prevailing today is a key uh, reason for these concerns, Anusha. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shahin Kada, with the latest on business confidence. After a short commercial break, we will be back with economist and LMD columnist Samantha Amar Singer with the latest on the economy. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja and with me now is economist with Standard Chartered Bank and LMD columnist Samantha Amarasinghe with the latest in our economy. Now, uh, Samantha, what impact will the recent electricity price hikes have on inflation and our overall economy? The electricity uh, tariff hikes have been implemented with the expectation that heavy state borrowings uh, may come down and uh, this will in turn help fiscal consolidation while also reducing interest rates um, as well as the cost of businesses. Um, in the near term, we feel that the administered prices are likely to exert uh, some upward pressure on inflation. And we can already uh, see some evidence of this in the May inflation print, uh, with inflation rising to 7.3% uh, from 6.4% in April. Um, if you look at the inflation subcategories um, for May, you will see that the most significant contributor um, to the rise in inflation was, in fact, uh, the increase of the utilities subcategory with the full impact of the electricity um, tariff hike, which came into effect in uh, late April, finally f uh, feeding through. Um, longer term, hopefully uh, reduced state borrowings uh, since our state-owned enterprises uh, will be in better shape, uh, will result in a greater stability overall, um, a lower fiscal deficit and also lower inflation. Now, what about our external trade position? Is there a severe strain in the light of the disagreement with the IMF over the US $1 billion loan and China also declining to provide a $500 million loan for petroleum product purchases? On the contrary, our um, base case is for a steady balance of payments position in 2013 um, due to stabilization of the trade balance. And this will be led uh, largely by lower oil prices and uh, increased hydropower generation. Um, it seems like there are brighter prospects on the external front. Uh, we saw the trade deficit contracting by uh, approximately 23% in uh, Q1, um, largely due to lower imports outpacing the drop in exports. Um, but with weak sentiment prevailing in the euro area in particular, um, we feel that exports will likely uh, continue to be a drag on growth. The fact that uh, oil prices look to remain relatively stable in 2013 uh, we feel will provide further upside to Sri Lanka's balance of payments and uh, reduced pressure from oil imports uh, should help to contain inflation uh, while the current account uh, will be further supported by a steady growth in tourist arrivals, remittances and uh, textiles and garments. Um, 
the outlook for the capital account is also positive. So uh, based on uh, the above factors, it looks like um, we will see another uh, small surplus in our balance of payments uh, this year. Samantha, how would you characterize Sri Lanka's fiscal outlook? Sri Lanka's fiscal outlook remains challenging, um, but great strides have been made over the past three years. The uh, fiscal deficit has narrowed to 6.4% in 2012 from close to 10% in 2009, um, largely due to the conditions attached to the standby arrangement with the uh, IMF, which ended last year, um, which pushed for various structural adjustments to the economy, including uh, tax revenue reforms, state-owned enterprise reforms and uh, curtailing public expenditure. Um, we feel although fiscal consolidation is underway, uh, many structural shortfalls in public finances uh, still persist and uh, significant revenue generating reforms are needed to maintain fiscal stability. Um, the recent electricity tariff and fuel price hikes um, are a positive step. Um, but uh, tax revenues definitely need a further boost um, as Sri Lanka still has one of the lowest uh, tax revenue to GDP ratios in the region at around 11% of GDP. That was The Economist of Standard Chartered Bank, Samantha Amarasinghe, with the latest on our economy. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.